Hi, and welcome to New Soft's Medical Practice Management Podcast Series. I'm Lindsay Coates. There have been 44 injuries and six deaths reported over the last year that have been attributed to health IT malfunctions. This is prompting the FDA to consider possible regulation of EHR and EMR systems. Here to speak with us about this potential regulation is Tim Gee. Hi. Hi. Hello. Okay, Tim. So the FDA is overseeing HIT, and it seems a little strange, like a little strange pairing. What um, What's the precedence or the history of that the FDA has in overseeing the, these systems? Well, Lindsay, the FDA has a legal mandate to uh, really regulate anything that could impact patient safety or efficacy, and. Um, that typically, I mean, there's a legal definition for what a medical device is, and it's really anything that's used to uh, diagnose or treat a patient that's not a drug. And, and, and so if you meet that definition, that's what they call a medical device. Most people think of a medical device as, you know, a box with a power cord and an on-off switch, and, and obviously that's not healthcare IT applications. Um, but the, the legal definition is something that's different, and a, uh, a software application can and do they do uh, meet the definitions of medical devices. And let me give you a couple of examples. Please. The uh, picture archiving and communication systems that acquire images from imaging modalities and move those around, automate the workflow to um, – so that they can be read by the radiologist and they can generate a diagnostic report and it gets archived and tagged as a relevant prior exam that may be viewed again if there's another exam done on that patient in the future. Um, that kind of software is a class two medical device and uh, it is regulated by the FDA and it actually requires um, approval or what is formally called clearance by the FDA uh, before it can be sold by the manufacturer. Uh, another example is blood bank software. The applications that are used to uh, track and manage the acquisition of donated blood and, and then that the resulting blood products then that can then be dispersed to patients, you know, in another country or in another state or, or at the same location is uh, a regulated medical device. And a third example is the um, a clinical lab information system, the software that acquires data from um, clinical lab analysis equipment, uh, blood gas analyzers and things like that, that matches that up with an order for a study and then uh, goes through the workflow of the physician, the pathologist generating the diagnostic report and, and then sending that out uh, to the ordering physician. Okay, so they have been regulating these systems, but have yet to do anything with EHRs or EMR software. That's what true. is the general consensus about the regulation of these types of systems? Well, uh, that depends on who you talk to. Um, <laughs> I'd say that there's a lot of people in the industry that feel like it's about time that the FDA should step up and in some cases regulate certain applications. And a good example of, of that would be the kinds of decision support systems that are used in uh, EMRs, particularly in uh, CPOE or, or uh, computerized physician order entry uh, applications. Um, those kinds of systems have um, a real impact on how care is delivered to the patient and on diagnostic uh, decisions as well as therapeutic choices. And um, and a number of the uh, patient injuries and deaths that uh, the uh, the head of CDRH at the FDA mentioned that had impacted patients um, uh, dealt with decision support software. So if, if I had to guess, that would probably be one of the first things they look at. Are there cons or what about if you ask somebody else? Obviously, right. there's opposition. Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of people... Um, take the position that if we regulate healthcare IT software, that the um, uh, it will stop innovation in the industry, that uh, costs will go sky high, that the, the rate of innovation will, you know, plummet. Um, and it, clearly <laughs> there is there is some impact. You don't get regulated by the FDA and have zero impact. Um, right. The what, what many people 
don't realize, particularly if they've never been regulated, is that the biggest the biggest impact of being regulated is is the FDA requires manufacturers uh, to be uh, to use a basic quality system in doing their business. So in in developing requirements, designing product, testing that product, how they um, do the ongoing service and support of that product so that they can identify latent defects and fix those. Uh, that's all driven by a very general quality system. That's the major hurdle. I guess the other big hurdle that people object to is if it's a class two medical device and they rank, the FDA classifies regulated devices, and I use that term device loosely, um, in three classes. Class one is lowest risk, like a tongue depressor. Um, the next highest risk is a class two, which could be like an infusion pump or a, a patient monitor. Um, a diagnostic imaging modality could be a class two. And then class three is for um, the highest risk products. These are the products that could be implanted, like a heart valve would be a class three device or a pacemaker. Uh, it could also be life support equipment, like a um, an intra aortic balloon pump that helps the heart beat um, in an ICU that that could be a class three device and um, a lot of the software that that we've talked about some of it is a class one some of it's a class two if it's a class two they have to have a 510k and the 510k refers to the portion of the legislation um, that mandates that manufacturers that of class two devices have to get FDA clearance, what's known as pre-market clearance, which basically means the FDA has to review everything and give you the green light before you can start to sell it. If you have a class one device, you just tell the FDA, hey, I've got this class one device, I'm selling it now. You don't have to get any kind of pre-market approval. So where do you see AHRs falling then? I would guess that some things will be a class two, like a decision support system, could be easily a yeah. class two device. So it's still kind of up in the air as far as where they could go with this. Right. What what the FDA has, has done is they've said that they're going to issue some guidance this sometime this year. And how much of that will be, it will be software oriented. How much of that will be focused on EMRs as opposed to uh, mobile health applications like software that you might use on an iPhone or a smartphone Right. Um, is, is, TBD, but um, uh, when the FDA, the FDA does this from time to time, they'll issue uh, a guidance document that um, basically describes how you should become compliant with the regulations for a particular area or particular type of product. Uh, another method that they use if they don't issue guidance is they'll, uh, a lot of times they'll do a reclassification, and so a product that maybe was a class three product by default, uh, they would reclassify it as a class one or a class two device. Um, and when they do that, they'll put a lot of verbiage around that reclassification that effectively makes it a, um, a mini guidance document. What about meaningful use certification and the ONC um, ATCB certification? Would that not be a reasonable route Right. Actually, Jeff Sheeran, the, the director of CDRH, um, which is the group in FDA that does most of the medical device regulation, um, he he gave testimony at an ONC meeting, I believe it was the end of last year. And there there appeared to be a bit of, uh, of a tussle between, um, you know, the ONC saying, well, we're, you know, we're looking at all of these important things with our uh, meaningful use certification, et cetera, and the FDA saying, well, you know, you're really not mandated to ensure patient safety um, like we are, that you're most interested in just getting interoperability and, you know, usability and, and things like that, reliability in the software. Legally right now, uh, the, the purview that, that the FDA has is unique to the FDA, and there's not any other body including the ONC and HITSBE and all the other groups um, that has that kind of mandate. And so um, uh, I don't see the FDA ceding 
the potential regulation of any any device that they feel should be regulated because of a patient safety issue uh, to anybody else. What should physicians be concerned about then with um, with you know FDA regulation? Should they have any? Well, there's probably two two things that physicians need to be aware of. First of all, a physician who who hires people to write their own software, and that software happens to be, uh, you know, the FDA has said, hey, we're regulating this kind of software, that physician becomes a manufacturer. So a manufacturer is someone who makes a regulated medical device. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. So a hospital that writes software could be a manufacturer. A, a physician who writes software or pays people to write software could be a manufacturer. Um, the other piece that they should be aware of is um, with their vendors, they should ask the question, A, is this an area where the FDA is regulating the software or do you have any um, expectation that they might in the near term? And if so, what is your regulatory strategy? If they buy a product and then and the FDA says we're regulating this and there's some kind of problem uh, that results in a recall uh, or, or the even worse, the FDA could say, well, you know, we're going to put a, a consent decree in place and you can't sell this product anymore, uh, you know, for the X period of time. So that could interrupt the delivery of service as well as supplying software to new and existing customers for a vendor. And if you're a buyer and you, you know, you're committed to that vendor, uh, it could, it could be problematic for you. Well, excellent. I really appreciate you talking with us today. Clearly we have a lot to look forward to. There's going to be a lot more coming out on this subject in the upcoming year and, and it's going to extend into next year, most likely. So I appreciate you giving us the heads up. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all our viewers. Make sure to tune in next month as well. And uh, have a great June.